thank you everyone for joining us. As everyone starts coming in, um, I'm gonna make some housekeeping announcements. And as I do that, I would love to see where everyone is tuning in from. So if you get the chance, please type in in the chat feature where you're tuning in from. Um, and if this is the first time you're joining the IC Talks, the international community of the Society of Professional Journalists, we're a community of journalists that really encourages press freedom globally. Our aim with the talk series is really to connect journalists at a time when it's really difficult to do so. So with these one-on-one -on -one conversations, we're aiming to dig a little deeper and create that opportunity for you all to have access to our guests. We hope you learn, grow, and take away from today information that will help you, inspire you, and everything that you need with your work going forward. And the format's really simple. So the guests and I are gonna have a conversation. We have the chat and Q&A feature open. So in the Q&A feature will be for you, the attendees to ask our guests question. So once you have your question, we will unmute you and you can ask them directly. If you prefer that I ask them for you, please make sure to make a note of that and I'm more than happy to do that for you. Um, please make sure that in the, chat for, in the chat portion, you leave any technical questions or concerns. My co-chair, Dan Kubiski, he's gonna keep an eye on that for us. And a special thanks to Dan who set up the talk today um, as a way by his wife and who's an ambassador, uh, Lisa Kubiski. She attended an event at the Montana World Affairs Council where there were a series of speeches to high school students and leaders. And that's gonna take me into introducing our speakers for today. Um, today we have Bill Clifford. He's the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of America, where he leads the organization's national office and represents its nonpartisan nonprofit network of more than 90 World Affairs Councils across the United States. Before joining the council, Bill served as Asia Bureau Chief for CBS Market Watch, where he launched and directed news bureaus in Japan and Hong Kong. He got his start in broadcast news with Asia Business News TV and was senior, senior correspondent in Tokyo for CNBC Asia after its merger with ABN. Bill began his work in journalism reporting in international economics, finance, and politics for several newspapers. Our other guest today joining us is Chris Hislop, Executive Director of the Montana World Affairs Council. He began his career as a high school teacher. He then served as a United States Peace Corps volunteer in Kyrgyzstan from 1995 to 1997. Following his service, he worked with humanitarian organizations and the United States around the world in Iraq, Kuwait, Jordan, Sudan, Myanmar, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Chechnya, the Balkans, China, Li Liberia, and Eritrea. Wow, that's amazing. So <laughs> thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. You know, this is the first time we're, really, we're actually having an organization and two people on for our talk. So I'm really looking forward to getting insights from both of you. So the pandemic has really disrupted the normal trajectory in, in every industry. And I kind of wanted to start the conversation by understanding of how has it affected the council as a whole bill? And Chris, maybe if you can focus on how it's affected the Montana chapter. Bill? Sure, thank you so much, Elle. It's great to be with you, and I appreciate the invitation from Dan and the Society of Professional Journalists. And it's always great to be on with my worldly colleague from Montana, Chris Hislop, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting in person just about a week before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, and, you know, we've had to pivot, um, individual councils have had to pivot, uh, but uh, the, the national network um, is, is uh, just a small headquarters in Washington, D.C. with a staff of three, plus interns and our back office team. Um, I've been in this job for seven years and have seen nothing quite like this, um, previously in Boston at our local affiliate there, where we uh, had to navigate the financial crisis this in a way is that the, that crisis on steroids because we have the health uh, pandemic we have the economic crisis and we have a social movement and crisis that is ripping our country in, apart uh, and so what in in some ways it's an opportunity while we're working remotely we've long wanted to take our in-person events which is what we're known for public forums that convene experts in all manner of national and international topics, especially on foreign policy, national security, 
economics and social justice issues uh, to the digital world. And this has been something that I think councils like uh, Montana World Affairs Council have navigated very swiftly and well. And um, what, what's interesting is that where we, we pitch ourselves as kind of a delivery vehicle with 90 plus councils coast to coast and Alaska and Hawaii, we're now creating content. We're recording our own sessions. We're building libraries at each council and at the national office. And while we certainly can't compete with media companies, we can work with them and with journalists. So I'm very excited to have this discussion today. Amazing. And Chris, how is the, can you tell us about how the pandemic has affected the uh, Montana chapter? Sure. First, again, thanks to you, Al, and to Dan. And nice to see you here as well, Bill, and um, to SPJ for having me on. Well, you know, this has affected all of us in different ways. And um, in Montana, of course, it's a very large state with a very sparse population. So even before the pandemic hit us, um, we had been programming online and virtually for several years. Um, a lot of our work has to do with schools in Montana. So um, although we do in-person distinguished speaker programs like many of the other councils across America, a big part of our work has been engaging schools, teachers, school kids on international issues. And so having had a few years of experience working with schools remotely, you know, um, doing a, a variety of online programming, we were already in a pretty good position to pivot, as Bill said, into a more um, virtual uh, delivery. So um, once shelter in place hit us, we were still going on with our programs um, with students. Uh, but then we launched um, Connect Montana, which is our distinguished speaker series, but a webcast now. Um, and it's very interesting for us because, um, you know, the, the World Affairs Councils, uh, Montana being one of the many, we're not big budget organizations, we're, we're small budget organizations, and we make the most of, uh, of the sponsorships and grants that we get. And having distinguished speakers come in person is a certain expense, but having them come online is not. And so we have um, also managed to deliver quite a good bit of content at a very low price. It may not be in person, um, but you know, as the situation has demanded it to be so, that's what we've been doing. And so uh, I'm just, you know, from our perspective, from the Montana World Affairs Council, you know, our programming has, has increased and in part kind of blossomed during this period. And we've learned enough about the, the virtual world where we're starting to translate that now into other programs coming up. So as an organization, I mean, you know, we've somehow managed to find our niche online uh, and, and to begin, as Bill said, deliver content here um, from our, you know, from our, uh, our well, our homes basically uh, across Montana. So there you are. Amazing. You know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how every industry is kind of maneuvering what to do going forward in the next year or two. And everything, as you said, is turning into a virtual world. And so, Bill, I'd like to see what is, what do you see when it comes to the content that you're creating for your audience and your community? What do you see is going to be the, the, the main subjects you want to focus on in the next few months? Because there's so much going on. And so I, I'm curious to see how you're curating that content. Well, um, I should say that the, the councils are independently governed and they program on their own. Mm -hmm. The National World Affairs Councils of America sometimes provides grant funding around certain national conversations. So for example, in 2019, and again shortly, we are going to uh, deliver uh, several council programs for the German foreign ministry. So it's a public diplomacy effort called Wunderbar Together that looks at transatlantic relations, which is a very uh, sensitive issue right now. Um, uh, and we, we have another program with World Food Program USA coming up, which will look at poverty issues around the world feature, featuring regional experts as well as the senior leadership at WFP USA. Um, I'd say that we're looking at all the timely top issues that affect 
uh, the United States and that speak to the U.S., uh, the American role in the world. And so that, that's a wide uh, umbrella of issues. Uh, we, we typically, through our annual national conference in November, WACA tries to isolate eight or ten big topics and then have other sessions where people can drill down into more specific nitty-gritty themes. But I, I think you can um, imagine that great power relations and rivalries, U.S. Uh, trade policy, specifically towards China, uh, are hot issues. Uh, what we're seeing in this country, again, as I mentioned, our, our racial uh, protests have cast a light on the, on the subject of Washington's ability to project our values and human rights policies so that we've been trolled by Beijing, we've been trolled by Tehran, and other countries are not looking to us the way they used to for leadership in that space. So that's uh, how America pro projects its values and uses soft power is very much uh, an issue that we need to look at um, in greater depth. Um, also the financial and economic uh, fallout from the, uh, from the pandemic will be an issue in, in a number of ways, the future of work, inequality as a broad issue in our democracy and around the world, um, what kind of, uh, uh, I think, the issue of big tech and to what extent it ought to be regulated. This is kind of, starts to seep over into the media world, how um, these big social media companies are, you know, their business models, how they'll be affected and what, and what um, impact they will have on news consumption and policy. Right. I find that very timely because recently, or maybe a few weeks ago, we've had Maria Ressa on uh, our talks, yes. and she talked very much about the role of social media and tech companies in the safety of journalists, especially for herself. Um, so, it, Chris, when I'd like to ask you, when it comes to the content of the subject matters that you're trying to bring for the students and the audience that you have within the Montana Council, what do you think about when it comes to content and how do you go about um, looking into those topics and what's timely for your, for your members? Yeah, I, I mean, this is a great question, Elle, because uh, I mean, for the viewers, we, we did have this preparatory talk with you and it mm -hmm. did occur to me how similar my, my thought process may be to that of journalists in, okay. in um, trying to bring content and trying to bring um, things to our membership and to our constituents here in Montana. What are we thinking about and how do we approach that? Um, not unlike journalists insofar as um, I need to know what is not simply the kind of issue du jour or what's on the headlines, but what is really interesting and what is impactful here in Montana um, in order to be sure that um, we're not simply delivering content because what I'm also trying to trying to deliver when we are doing our programs is I'm trying to deliver a kind of two-way channel, if you will. I, I see our role here as, you know, providing um, the basis for greater understanding and, and therefore that would lead to the opposite channel of greater engagement and having students and people here in Montana see that these issues, understand them better, the basics, how they impact them, and then how can they have some effect on those issues themselves. And so it's for us very important to kind of choose wisely. It's no surprise to anybody that Montana is a, a very kind of internationally looking state. Um, because our, our farming and ranching forms the main part of our economy here, and that's in a, you know, a highly competitive global market, our farmers and ranchers, I mean, when we go out you know, in, in uh, the remote parts of Montana and speak to, to people who are running ranches and farms, Believe me, they know U.S. policy on China better than the deal. I mean, they know the ups and downs because their livelihoods depend on it. And so we do have a very, you know, a, a very um, well, um, well read and, and engaged population. So what I'm trying to do then is find what, what are the issues that matter? So for, for instance, here in Montana, a big issue is clean water, clean air, and clean land. Mm. Now, then Bill mentioned something very important um, 
that you know we are nonpartisan, and so some of these issues, um, another one being say affordable housing, uh, equitable housing, these can be hot button political issues, especially in the run up to an election. Wow. So, yeah. but where we see our role here in in Montana is less jumping into the domestic political fracas on say affordable housing, and a little bit more on on asking questions like, well, where in other parts of the world, are they succeeding in providing affordable housing? Can we get a speaker from, say, Finland or a Scandinavian country to come on and talk to us, not about the domestic question, but about how does it work in another part of the world? And in doing so, we feed that the outward channel of gaining understanding and knowledge about an issue, and then giving people the means then to engage more clearly on this really important issue. So that's how we're seeing it. These issues are, you know, we're, we're picking and choosing based on what we know and what we hear from Montanans across the state on what matters to them. That's, a, in, that's incredible to know that because it's, you're basically bringing a global perspective to a local audience. And Chris, can you let us know why is that so important now? I know you mentioned that a lot of the con the, the programming that you're putting out right now, or we're focusing on is everyone, the world is looking at the US right now with what's happening here. And for the longest time, it seems as if we were providing content from outside and connecting the US to the global world. So I'd like to know from your perspective, what is that relationship with bringing the global perspective to a local audience? And why is that so important for a journalist to be aware of this, bringing that information here? Yeah, I, I, and I'll just add to it, Al. I mean, to, to kind of round sure. that, the, the, the question, which is, you know, it is about um, our, our, our kind of tagline here is bringing the world to Montana and Montana mm -hmm. to the world. Right. And so that's a, a simple way of kind of rounding out what you said. So for us, bringing the world to Montana, um, you know, actually, it's not so difficult. We think about the issues that matter to Montanans. We think mm -hmm. about you know, who can we get? We have, uh, we have the, the um, national office runs a huge database of potential speakers who are ready and willing to come in on a huge range of issues. We have a great network with the U.S. Institute of Peace, with the U.N., with the State Department, and, and many others that we can draw from. So bringing a kind of international cut or the, the international facet on what may normally be a domestic issue is, is, is you know, pretty easy. More interestingly is the other side of that circle. I mean, for me, oftentimes what we are finding here is we have a lot of people here in Montana who have extraordinary international experience and who can bring that into our community. So instead of looking, you know, uh, out far and in deep um, for speakers, um, you know, we also try to cultivate the, the Montana perspective here and, and to try to share that. So for instance, on my webcast, we had one week of um, nonprofits based in Montana, but who work internationally on, uh, on humanitarian issues, um, ecology, and, and so on, community development. So what we're trying to do then is to, to provide this balance, if you will, of this kind of the, the international coming in and, and satisfying this great desire of people here in Montana to know more and learn more about the world, but also helping those same people see look at what else is going on here in our state and how we as Montanans engage in the world and how you can kind of join that engagement as well. Amazing. Help me, I jump in on that? Uh, Absolutely, point. I was I just mean, about to ask you too. <laughs> what Chris is saying about the engagement and interactivity is very important and the, the learning is not just a one-way street by any means. Mm -hmm. As a recovering journalist, and I last had my reporting job at the earlier part of this millennium. Um, but I, I, I was based primarily in Tokyo and covered Asia. And I would say that one thing is when I would return to the United States, the uh, sort of appetite for conversation about Japan could, could, could be limited to um, you know, a few minutes. And then we were talking about Jerry Seinfeld show or some, some, other, some other topic that people knew something about. And, uh, um, you know, so I think one of the things is to, to actually let people see and hear and, and get a chance to ask questions of uh, representatives of, of uh, foreign countries or those who have spent time there and can and share expertise. 
Um, the other, the other uh, sad truth is that, um, and, and I, I saw this um, firsthand as a broadcast journalist, is that budgets uh, for international news coming mm -hmm. into the U.S., uh, both both in broadcast and in print, started to really uh, get hammered and squashed as as uh, the internet rose, and and that the expensive job of keeping journalists in the field uh, changed. One of the things that's really positive that I think a lot of your uh, uh, listeners are are able to support is that um, it wasn't just. Americans abroad providing news gathering and, and coverage, but that you know we would rely on teams of, of locals and that they themselves were just as professional as we are in delivering stories to an American audience. But the, 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 the budgetary uh, impact was severe. And the other thing is, as the US media landscape has become so polarized, and as the educational landscape in K-12 has uh, shifted priorities and in many ways diminished budgets for humanities and social studies and foreign languages. I think our job is harder but more necessary. We, we shatter stereotypes by bringing these speakers uh, to our local audiences and it's very important that all uh, councils like uh, Montana that Chris runs um, really gets gets into this business of providing um, exchange of you know th these perspectives amazing and so with your background in journalism you know the importance of building relationships with um, sources and contacts that are local and so especially now that it's difficult to go abroad and build those relationships i'm curious beyond the content that you guys are creating and the talks where people can engage kind of like what we're doing here um, what other resources are available for journalists with the World Affairs Council that they probably would have not known about before? Bill? If, hmm. Well, um, we have uh, not only our network of, of World Affairs Council members, and they, uh, many of them, engage with local media, local NPR stations, local television so stations, and, and newspapers, and their editorial boards, and their reporters. Um, at the national level, we're also plugged into, uh, you know, 180 plus embassies that are based in DC, uh, as well as think tanks and universities here, also around the country, also around the world that are, uh, uh, include faculty from everywhere. The think tanks have specialists from everywhere as do international organizations. So there is a really rich opportunity for us to, to uh, as, Chris mentioned we have a, a database of speakers that our councils uh, who want extra ideas on how to source um, people to convene, they can go there. Um, and journalists can, can work with us in many ways. They can moderate panels at our conferences. They can moderate individual events, now virtually. Um, and of course, when, the, when the, the topic is news itself and what's happening to uh, the industry of media, um, we need we need you and chris what what is your yeah. perspective on um well, are you do you have a built relationship with local journalists in montana um or is that not the case you wish there was more we do we, we've got good relationship with journalists based in the different cities across right. montana and, and that really matters to us mm -hmm. um to be sure you know at, at its basic part to know what our programs are, what's coming up, um, you know, we keep everybody informed. And then, um, you know, when we have larger events to be sure that the, that the journalists and the local media people are, are aware of what's going on and to give them the information. Um, it, but one other role that um, I see is very important to directors like myself, and then certainly Bill would see this um, for, for the network as a whole, which is to say that, we, the, the, the council itself, the Montana World Affairs Council, wants to um, uh, place itself in this community, in this state, as a kind of honest broker, a clear voice, a knowledgeable voice on international issues. So whatever comes up, oftentimes journalists will rightly, you know, maybe uh, call a source who's an academic or, or an expert on a topic for sure. Um, but I'm also trying to be sure that my name um, is on their list. Um, 
especially when it comes to things you know that are very broad based and have a kind of um, the the voice of what is the general impact of this on us you know asking that question when journalists have that question I, I try to you know a, to say listen here's my number please call me any time that you want to get something that's maybe not so dialed in and so focused as a as a real subject matter expert but somebody who is looking at the connections from uh, you know the issue on the two other issues on the three other countries and then trying to bring it back into why does this matter for Montana and Montana so trying to um, establish ourselves as that voice and as that resource for journalists is a major priority for us. Amazing. And so we really focus on with SPJ, the international community, the subject of press freedom. And there are so many cases this year that we're seeing of this suppression of press freedom around the, country, around the globe. I'm curious to get your perspective on from both you and Bill, Bill and Chris, um, what is your perspective on press freedom and why should the people in the United States be aware of what's happening abroad and also abroad with what's happening here in the U.S.? Because for the longest time, we haven't seen what's been happening here in the U.S. ever. It's unprecedented. So I'd like to get your perspective, Bill, first. Well, um, what we're seeing today, I would argue, in this country on many levels is what we've come to see in other uh, countries that are less liberal, that are illiberal, or that are authoritarian, and that restrict uh, how journalists do their jobs. Um, there has been great violence, even fatal um, uh, incidents involving hundreds of journalists that the Committee to Protect uh, Journalists, CPJ, and that your organization, uh, SBJ, also uh, uh, stands up for and, and, and attempts to combat. We've seen um, political leaders in this country going all the way to the top threaten journalists in certain ways, sometimes physically. Uh, even a congressman who did so from a certain state got elected to office despite that. So, um, you know, that's dangerous. It's also troubling the way that, um, I mean, every White House and every political office of state and mayor level also has their um, issues with how they're covered. But what we've seen um, these days is, is really uh, strange in how um, you know, the interaction with the media and officials, including you know, scientists at a time of pandemic, that's concerning. How, um, how journalists have to now cover um, some of these protests. They're wearing gas masks, I mean, to protect themselves from tear, uh, uh, tear gas. They're, wearing vests to protect themselves from rubber bullets or live kinds of ammunition. I mean, this is something that I think, you know, if you were to ask me as a journalist, and I was not in war zones for the most part, I was in financial markets and, and covered economies. Um, this is really frightening stuff and it's happening here. So, um, you know, I think the journalists are doing their very best to continue to gather and they have support of their editorial uh, teams. Um, but this is an issue that really is likely to become part and parcel of, of how we view our, democ our democratic society and what we want from it as voters, as citizens. Chris? Well, um, I mean, Bill really hit on all of the main issues. I'll add from my perspective um, something that has come across, and I've had a, quite a number of webcasts over the past few months with people from all over the world talking about a huge range of issues. Um, uh, and the question I always pose to them is, why does this matter? You know, what, you know it's kind of the so what question that, that is so important to help people get kind of beyond the fact, you know, you know, we're delivered a lot of facts. Let's let's see if we can hear why why when you put all these facts together, does it make some difference in my life? And you know, everybody and unprompted, and I'm sure you know many of our guests have heard the same thing. This this phrase of kind of now more than ever. You know, now 
in what is happening in the world, that what Bill has described, um, you know, our, our racial and social inequality, and not just in America, but around the world, um, the COVID crisis, of course. And so when I ask people, why does it matter? It's, it, is a, it is an answer of now more than ever, which I would say to your question specifically about journalists and media professionals bringing us the facts and bringing us beyond the facts, the, the so what answer is absolutely critical that we're able to understand this in an era of, of such a, a huge and an enormous amount of information coming at us much of it kind of questionable and, you know, the old fake news um, idea, you know, it is, it is to professional journalists who keep to their ethic uh, uh, of journalism to provide us with, you know, this kind of well-researched and accurate information that we need again now more than ever. Yes. And if I could add to that, you know, the, the um, assault on facts is really uh, a terrible crisis as well in this country. When, when, you can draw maps of weather systems that are not true when you can actively suppress bureaucracies from providing data. Uh, there, there's, there are acts of commission, of omission, and um, I, I want to hesitate to say that you know, this, is, this is not meant to be a partisan comment. There are things that uh, both parties have done um, while holding power. Um, this seems to be a little more severe. One thing that, to get specific on something that has, has shocked me, is that the New York Times came out with a story on uh, Russian bounties on the heads of American soldiers in Afghanistan. And this must have emerged from a leak from uh, either uh, the Department of Defense or our intelligence services, or both. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that it was verified to a certain degree. Um, but in terms of the follow-up on not only that subject, which deserves great media attention, yes, it's a competitive news environment. Uh, we have to go for the pandemic. We have to go for protests and so forth. But this is a major international story that has gotten almost no follow-on coverage. And the questions from journalists who have to be sharp on the time they have to ask questions of people in power have, you know, for almost 30 days, not homed in on this subject, which, you know, there are human lives at stake in Afghanistan that are protecting this country and demand statements from the commander in chief. And our public needs to know after a whole spate of issues concerning Russia and its actions overseas and in this country that affect Americans, we need to know what our policy is. Right. That just isn't being Absolutely. presented. And that's one of the areas that we try to fill as councils to convene. It could be academics, it could be think tank experts, it could be policy practitioners currently, it could be former uh, ambassadors and so on, and they have spoken to these issues. Amazing. So we have a question that just came in. Uh, looks like it's from Charles Gerber. Um, how does, I believe this is for you, Chris, how does Montana Council address dissemination of information or discuss threats to journalists in the U.S. from various elected officials, including the manner that elected officials respond by speaking in a hostile and or rude manner against civility to a journalist's question? Well, the, the short answer is we've not addressed that, um, but I would be very happy. Again, um, I'm always looking, everybody I talk to, I'm asking what, what is key issues? What is important to you? And, and how can we convey this to our audience and our constituency? So uh, I, 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 I know the, the, the event that you are referring to, um, and it's of course not just a problem you know, in, in one small part of the world. It, it's something you know, that's critical all around the world. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly we have not done anything about that, but I would be very interested, you know, if, if this is a key issue um, for, um, you know, journalists and, and media professionals around the world, please let me know. Let me know how we can approach this question in a way that, again, you know, my kind of, my bar is about, you know, how does this affect Montana and Montanans? How can we help them figure out what to do, 
How can they engage on this topic? Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you, Chris. You know, that brings up an interesting point for me. Um, I wonder how much do you, because for us, I know we try to listen to our community and see what's on their mind and what things they want to hear about to provide those resources. At the same time, you want to be able to key in some things that may, they may not have thought about. So how important is it and what do you listen to in regards to your community? What kind of things are they asking for? And how do you gauge that with, uh, well, let's bring in some other things that we think is also relevant for you to know about. Bill? Hmm. Well, I was just thinking, you know, one of the, one of the ways that we are similar to um, journalists and people who are gathering information and facts is we want to identify as you did at the top you know what are what are key issues that we should present to our audience and how can we grow our audience by presenting compelling uh, conversations discussions uh, video clips and so on I mean one of the one of the things where we're similar is take an issue like climate change we we like journalists, um, I mean, ours is meant to be a civil objective platform where multiple perspectives can uh, be presented so that our audience can make up its own mind, you know, that this, the people in attendance become well informed by bringing their knowledge, acquiring knowledge, making judgments, asking questions from people who have different views on topics like climate change. But we have to be wary of both sides-ism, where, for example, climate denial has equal weight with climate uh, change experts who ground their attitudes and writings and research and everything in science. And, you know, over, I think, it, you know, decades ago, it might have been okay to, to put two people on stage who had completely different views on whether or not climate change exists. But now we know, we see with our own eyes, we can bring, we have so much evidence, so much. What we need to do is really concentrate on, okay, how are we gonna fix it? What are the different ideas and approaches? How can we make this equitable? Who is doing what in what country that's getting funded that can, can scale around the world to help us all? Cities are doing this. Right. Internationally, they're having that engagement. So we learn from those experts. But to go to, we, we need to be careful because there are so many issues where this could be possible to say, okay, we need to entertain with an equal weight climate denial from the, 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 the climate science. It's not that anymore. Do you, do you think there are certain subjects that are kind of being drowned down with the pandemic coverage that probably deserves more attention for your perspective? Well, you know, we're in a, in a, I'll let Chris grab some airtime here. I mean, we're in an election year, and there is, um, you know, apart from the, 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 the policy issues that need to be debated, right, there's a functioning issue of of making sure people can exercise their constitutional right to vote and voter suppression is real and that needs to be explored that's not so much um, uh, a, a typical world affairs council issue but to the extent that the united states continues to be a functioning well thought of uh, democracy in the world with um, you know weight to throw around because of that fact um, how we do our election is really important. And we, you know the outcome is going to be predicated on fairness and access to the polls. And Chris? I think what Bill says there about moral equivalency on these issues is really important. Um, and of course, we keep that a, a, as a central thought, and I'm sure journalists do as well. Um, and, you know, we would all also um, think about the other part of that, you know, the other side of that equation is, you know, maintaining a, a really clear perspective on moral equivalency, but also um, 
being sure not to kind of shut out voices for the for the sake of it. I mean, Bill is mentioning this this balance, and it's tricky. I don't have an answer to it, but it's one we're really aware of, um, both in the run up to an election year and in a very um, in the very divisive American political atmosphere. I mean, we all know what is going, or we we, we sense what is going on, that there's not much of a dialogue anymore. It's like twin monologues on key issues that are, you know, domestically important. They're key electoral issues and they're, they're important around the world. But on, you know, B Bill mentioned climate change, which is, and climate science. So, so um, let me tell you from our perspective here in Montana, how, how we're thinking about this issue. Number one is, you know, it's a huge and, and key international issue and therefore, you know, we think about our niche. Um, there are many other organizations and professionals who engage in the domestic debate on climate change. Our place is not so strong there. Our place is much stronger when we engage from the international perspective. And so in a way, I mean, what, what we're trying to do in Montana, and I think other um, uh, World Affairs Councils, because we are nonpartisan, are also thinking about is this honest brokerage on issues that, be, because where we are now as in our society, they are they are considered divisive social or political issues like climate change. But it, while that may be a divisive social and political issue, it is a much larger issue than that. A much larger issue. Therefore, if we want to engage in this, we have to overcome the obstacle of this dual monologue where, where you know, one group is pitted against the other with, you know, each has their page of talking points and each fires them over each other's heads without listening and, and engaging on, on what is the broader issue. They stay in, in this one place as a, as a very political or electoral issue. Where we think we can add value again is to bring in this international perspective which in part kind of, it doesn't uh, remove or create a moral equivalency in, in a difficult issue, but it just, it, it kind of short circuits the, the domestic debate where people are ready with their talking points. If they're hearing an expert from Kenya talk about the impact of climate change on their country, it's, it, it gives more space, or we like to think it does, for people to think the issue through, to find a little bit of understanding uh, because they're not being um, fed and they're not being shouted at points that they've heard many times from the other side, if you will. Mm -hmm. So this is where I think on, on issues like, you know, Bill mentions climate change, there's a, you know, a long list of, of very important critical issues where, where we want to come in on those issues is from an international perspective, from, from a kind of depoliticized, but, but an informational and an engaging way to bring people in on, it, essentially it is the same issue, right? But it's just not within a form where you immediately put side on side and then you just, you know, you, you try to get through something and all you end up hearing is, you know, uh, Fox News talking points on one side, C CSNBC talking points on the other. Right. Yeah. Bill? And I, I just wanted to add that we actually did one of our Engage America national conversations on um, what was titled the Rational Middle Energy Series. And it was uh, the, the brainchild of an independent film documentarist. And he did episodic looks at aspects across the spectrum, across stakeholders and and communities about how um, energy and environment and climate intersected. This series was sponsored by Shell, an oil and gas company, and we made the funds that we received available to councils to have them independently select the experts they wanted. Shell had no sort of advertorial reign and choice in the matter of this. But, you know, it looked at all kinds of issues from regulatory to uh, employment to, you know, we, it's not to say there's no place, I, I want people to be clear that, you know, we're not saying if you're a coal producer or a coal worker or something, you have no business talking to a World Affairs Council. Absolutely the opposite. 
I'm very fascinated by industrial transformation, how companies are changing with knowledge and information and awareness of what it takes to secure our planet and also deliver the conveniences and the things that consumers and workers demand. It's so complicated. Um, I wouldn't put up a climate denier on my podium, but I would not reject one from the audience who's learned about, you know, something from some source and wants to say, hey, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm hearing this. We need to politely engage and, and see if we can come to a middle ground. Right. I, Ella, I'd like to add sure. to, to, to Bill right there. That's a really important point from the, from the kind of grassroots level here in Montana which is to say a lot of um, the councils across America receive you know, um, support and sponsorship from any number of, of, of places. Here in Montana, we are supported by some of the energy companies here. They're an important part of our community. They do important work. They're an important voice in, in, in who we are and what we do. And so um, you know, when I engage with um, people from um, the energy company, I'm asking them the same questions I ask everybody. You know, what is important to you? How can we how can we get um, issues that are important to enough of us out there? And of course, for an energy company, and here in Montana we have coal mines and we use coal for for some of our energy. This is an important issue, not just for for broadly speaking for the uh, ecology and clean air and clean land and clean water. But it's important for energy companies as well because they're also, Bill mentioned industrial transformation and transition. It's a really key right. element here. And so we're the same way. And it, it might be good for journalists to know that you know, we're in touch with a, a wide range. I don't talk to people who only think like me and, and, and talk like me. I, I'm in touch and I want to hear from people who don't think like me at all or, or who can give me an entirely new perspective on a key issue. Amazing. And so we do have a question that just came in. I just want a reminder, if anyone has questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A section. Um, so this is for you, Bill. Bill mentioned in the beginning, um, the role of the U.S. is being damaged because of the racial divide and political divide. Have you guys seen or have you seen this in their programs? Um, have there been programs that discuss this? And can you raise the academic question, Quest program to get high school students involved in international affairs with this? Chris, do you wanna go first? Or is, is that directed to me? Um, I know Bill, you mentioned it, but if Chris, okay. you'd like Chris to answer, that's more than, okay. Chris, why don't you take the, the yeah. student piece? Yeah, sure, I mean, um, Look, uh, we're, we're very happy. Uh, you know, we engage students across Montana on the widest range of issues, again, all with this international band, and clearly this is a big one, and I expect that to be an important part of, we have, we have two or three major programs that we deliver across the state, and surely this will be one of the elements this year. Um, I, I do want to add one other thing, just on um, the, um, the, um, the question of you know r racial injustice and and what has been happening here in America over the past months, um, not to forget that um, we also uh, are on the radio um, and so just to to, to bring this out right. for the radio journalists out there as well, um, in a state like Montana, radio is hugely important um, you know in in broadcasting you know everything news weather sport what have you. Um, in places where the internet is not reaching or not reaching adequately. So we actually last month had a show on our, we have a, a hour and a half radio show twice a month. Uh, and uh, we had a show on this. And, and again, you know, as always, and I, I keep repeating it, but I, it's important is that it's, you know, it's not just, you know, race writ large. That's part of the conversation, but the conversation will always zoom back into why does this matter for Montana right now? You know, who, you know, why should you care about this? Think, how should you think more deeply into the matter? So, I mean, here, that's just a pitch maybe for radio as well. Over to you, Bill. Well, one of the things that I really appreciated and enjoyed when I visited Montana in early March for the statewide academic world quest program that Chris and his team uh, put on, which is a, a multi-day affair that's really engaging. Uh, you know, for me, 
um, one of the, 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 the great memories was interacting with some students and teachers who are Native American and the inclusion of them in the program and, and to see how uh, Montanans who are white or non-white interact with the Native Americans who are there and, and there's great learning that comes from that. It's amazing. Um, you know, nationally, uh, we, like many organizations, have, have been horrified by uh, the George Floyd murder and all that has flown from it. Um, there, there are positive elements, and one of them is that the protests in America were um, carried in some way or appreciated as, as protests were in, in 1968, um, you know, internationally. And to understand that that there is solidarity across borders on something like racism, I think that you know some councils are, as I said at the beginning, independent and uh, structured differently. Some are all volunteers. Some have great resources financially, uh, different staffing levels, and they have to pick and choose what they can do. Um, I think it's important that they stretch their their communities. Um, we need voices um, uh, uh, from communities of color, and we need younger people. And typically, our demo demographic kind of profile has not been that. Um, and and the, way to, the way to get there is to engage speakers, to reach out to new audiences through all kinds of media platforms and aggressively by picking up the phone and partnering creatively with organizations where we will see different perspectives from those communities. Um, nobody's afraid of it, I think. I can safely say that in the network that I've, I've seen. Um, but it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this is an opportunity for us as a, as a country, not just as a, a nonprofit to really investigate all aspects uh, of, of, of the issue. I can say that even in producing a statement on racial justice, diversity, and inclusion, which I'm proud to say our board of directors um, uh, agreed to and approved, it's on our website, um, and mm -hmm. that's, that's the correct talk, but we have to walk it. You know, it wasn't easy for some people. Some people don't like the word structural racism or maybe not understand systemic racism, but we know it exists. It's, it's throughout all, all layers of society. It's not just the criminal justice system and our, our, our law enforcement. It is in education, in welfare, in uh, job opportunities, in uh, where you get to live and how you get to bank and how you get to live your life. And we need to be very humble and very open. And I commend the councils who are able to do this more than others. It's, it's a work in progress and we will, we will move with it. Amazing. And I know you've mentioned it's really important to have the voices out there. And I, I, I remember reading this last week the importance of social media in these last few months and how it's really been a platform that people find as a resource, as a source for their news and the information that they're getting to make sense of what's going on. And I'm curious to see how important is it having your, the voice of the World Affairs Council and each chapter on these platforms. Is that something that you guys have been thinking about doing and how is that approach? Is it with Bill and then Chris? Well, um, I, I, I just was schooled actually in, in doing a strategic planning session with another council um, on the east, eastern side of the country. Um, I made the point that we're not, um, we're not in the business of advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean we can't advocate for our mission and we can't stand up for issues like, you know, how we, I, I guess you could say, editorially select the issues that we present. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, are, we are really the platform and, and the expertise is for our audiences to, to grapple with and, we can come in for criticism and we can be
be shaped in our programming choices after an event that mm -hmm. doesn't wash with people. Um, but we're not, it should be known to your audience, we're not to, uh, you know, I have great, great um, uh, alignment with press freedom, for example, but I'm not going up to Capitol Hill saying the World Affairs Council is behind this subject or that subject. We do not advocate in that sense legislatively, uh, the local or the national level. It's just to provide excellent thinking that can help people understand issues that are complex and that they can take home and have, you know, have it resonate and, and lead to their own decisions. Yes. And then Chris, so, would you like to add to that? Sure. I, from, you know, the, the state based council perspective, we're using social media like many do number one to, to push content out our own content, um, you know, on, 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 you know, uh, whether we're webcasting or otherwise, um, but we also use it. It's an important element for our partnership. Um, we are, um, you know, constantly seeking partners um, whom we can work directly with on international issues who have some kind of an international perspective. So, for example, um, the Montana State Department of Agriculture is one of the most internationalized parts of our state government here due to, you know, the global trade. And so, um, you know, I'm constantly, uh, you know, using their social media feeds, sharing, retweeting, re, you know, reposting mm -hmm. things that, and, and, and they're doing the same. I see this as a very simple, um, effective and, um, you know, cost zero way to, you know, build your constituency and, and to support membership because um, these people with whom, you know, we're partnering, um, they end up being key when we want to have webcasts, when we do programs and, and they help us broaden our network, they help us broaden our perspective. And lastly, uh, obviously, social media is a key marketing um, channel for us. Um, as a small nonprofit, we need to find ways to effectively reach our constituency at low cost. And, you know, that it, it works pretty well. We need to jump into the 21st century here and start, you know, uh, issuing TikToks and, and um, getting onto Snapchat and all of that. But, um, you know, slowly but surely we're doing that. But um, to be sure, it's a, it's a really a central part of, of what we do. But I, I don't, I also don't want to overemphasize it. It's a good tool. It does mm -hmm. well in, in what we use it for, um, but it's certainly not something that we rely on to, to get our message out. Um, you know, we rely on other channels. And I should say, I, I think I misconstrued the question. And so uh, just to, uh, you know, Chris handled it beautifully. Um, what we do nationally in our social media usage primarily is to share and retweet, retweet uh, uh, the, the uh, links and video clips and short pieces that highlight, uh, maybe calendar entries that highlight the great work of councils around the country. What we want to show is that we have a unique national platform of local councils that raise awareness on a variety of issues. And so we're, we're, our approach is to really celebrate and spread the word of what's happening um, when we have our uh, national conference and our national academic world quest high school championship and some other uh, programs that we we disseminate to the network from dc we will use our social networks for and social media for for transmitting announcements and things like that amazing and then we had a question that was in from our community I believe this is for Bill. Um, our key number one to know, as a journal, previous journalist that's now in the nonprofit world, what are some tips that you have for transitioning your career into the nonprofit world and how, why and how did you make that decision? Oh, I love that question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, how I transitioned it was I, I moved with my family from Tokyo and the golden passport that journalists carry with, um, you know, basically knowing so many people uh, that you build up in your, in your network and Rolodex and so forth to nothing. I did not have a job waiting for me in Massachusetts. And at, my intention was to sort of look after my very young children for a while and figure out the next move, whether there would be a journalism job. And as I mentioned earlier, 
um, the industry was going through quite a change. And someone who, uh, whose expertise was international news had many more limited options. And I wasn't going to move to Atlanta and try to CNN. I tried Frontline with PBS, but those are golden jobs that people hold on to for life. <laughs> um, so I needed to do something else. And I started volunteering at a number of different educational nonprofits, uh, both in kind of the academic after school space uh, for underprivileged city youth, and also in the athletic uh, uh, space uh, for the same. Um, and I, I, I uh, volunteered also for the American Red Cross's Massachusetts Bay chapter. And that gave me a real sense of, of uh, kind of the direction I wanted to go. And then lo and behold, the, the uh, position at World Boston, the sister organization to Montana World Affairs Council became open and I applied and I got the job. And I quickly learned that some of the same skills, uh, same interest um, of expanding uh, your audience reach as we would in, you know, in front of a camera or on a radio show or writing for a newspaper um, is part of the name of the game. How do we provide information, networking opportunities, people and ideas to the people of Boston, and that appealed to me. Uh, also, the skill set of approaching funders and to gain their trust and to cultivate them over time. Thank God, I knew how to, you know, do that with sources who were providing me with news uh, okay. tidbits and, and pieces that I would, you know, meld into into stories and and, and broadcasts. So the skill sets, the, the 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 goal of reaching large audiences was maybe this was a, a, a place for me, plus the international yeah. element as well. Right. And these are great tips for those journalists that are looking to transition and that next phase in their lives. And so, you know, I can't believe the hour is up and I just want to make sure if there's any questions that anyone has, they want to ask Bill or Chris, this is that opportunity to do that. I'm going to ask my final question to, uh, to round up our conversations for today is for both of you, where do you see the future of global dialogue and what does it look like? Oh boy. Well, I mean, Bill mentioned that he's a recovering journalist. I'm a recovering UN bureaucrat. Um, and so uh, having worked inside the UN for 20 years and you ask a question like international dialogue, I think my DNA kicks in pretty quickly um, to think about the multilateral organizations that, that support you know, um, global conversation. And again, you know, now more than ever, uh, I think um, we need to look at those regional and um, international multilaterals um, where people can um, have respectful um, dialogue and have uh, the opportunity to make progress. So if, if I look at the future, I mean, it's, it's not simply looking at the past and looking at you know, our existing structures, but it's to remind us that we do have quite an extraordinary set. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the UN as, a, uh, you know, as an overarching body and then it's many regional um, organizations uh, around the world um, serving at, to convene um, countries on key issues to help um, those countries and those people resolve their issues themselves. Um, it is a huge investment that humanity put into this system uh, following you know, World War II and, and the Bretton Woods organizations are still here. They're still functioning in a way that um, may be easy to criticize but impossible to replace. Uh, and so uh, when I think about the, the future of dialogue on international issues, I, I would immediately tend towards ensuring that um, people know uh, what these organizations are and what they do for them. Again, it's, um, I'll give you a, a really quick example. Uh, here in my little town in Minnesota, um, our local mayor was criticized recently for um, um, at the city council suggesting that following the George Floyd murder, which was here in Minnesota, that they make reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that it was a United Nations document to which the city council disagreed because of the United Nations aspect of it. You know, mm -hmm. so there remains in our society in many places this kind of concern and worry about these organizations, but that concern and worry is, is based, you know, 
uh, on, on not really knowing what they do and how they do it. So I see, you know, probably to connect that with our World Affairs Council uh, to say, here's another great opportunity for all of us to bring um, back to America the idea that America spawned in 1948 of having an international set of structures and, and things that could bring people together, uh, it, you know, in order to support peace and security. So, there, yeah, I mean, can you tell that I was a UN guy? I guess so. <laughs> That's amazing. And Bill, is there anything you'd like to add? I'll just say that, you know, the World Affairs Council's founding uh, organization, the Foreign Policy Association, based in New York, started in 1918 after World War I. And it was really about having ordinary Americans understand the world. Simple as that. What, what influences were being really brought to bear on the United States and with a budding international effort with the League of Nations and Wilson's 14 points and what role we would have. After World War II, we saw another surge and, and, and councils really were, you know, they're probably uh, about 30 by that point, um, vested in understanding America's global influence and 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 we were the sole power that was reconstructing Europe and the NATO alliance was built then and so forth um, and we were in the, uh, the the onset of the Cold War and the nuclear age that we had another run where our network grew and here we are today um, after uh, a, a world where 9/11 happened and we were confronting terrorism where the the Great Recession happened, a huge financial crisis. Now we're in a pandemic, coupled with a financial crisis, tripled with a social crisis, and we're turning inward. I think the, the message that, that we try to convey is Americans are connected, need to be connected. People who live in our borders, whether they're not even Americans, need that too. And we should engage. We need to engage because we can learn. And we're not going to solve global problems on our own. We need help, we need to listen, and we need to use our voice when, when it's appropriate to. I mean ours as a country. So World Affairs Councils, our role is to digest, digest that by providing expertise that, that our communities can access. And if we do that, we're gonna be, we're gonna be helping uh, to create a more peaceful and prosperous world, even if we don't always agree. Wonderful. I mean, that's a great way to round up our conversation. Is there anything else that you, either of you would like to add before we say goodbye to our attendees? Please share my email with okay. all your uh, society members. I would like to be a resource um, for, and, and as a former journalist, I, I'm a, you know, I'm not always an adept storyteller, but I love listening to stories from the field and the experiences of journalism mean a lot to me too, of uh, journalists. Thank you yeah. so much. S same from my side, uh, Elf. Thank you very much for having me on, but I just encourage the, the members uh, and people watching to think about this uh, extraordinary network of councils as a resource to you, as a resource on any issue, on anything that is international, we have something to say. If we don't know about it, we find out about it. We learn about it. We have the network. So please, uh, I encourage you all to, to be in touch with us, um, you know, whenever you have questions, comments, points on, on what is happening around the world. Wonderful. And thank you both so much for joining us today. Before we end our conversation, I'm going to go over the speakers that we have for the month of August, which we're really excited about. Um, on the 4th, we're going to have Moshe Onunu, former executive producer of CBS Evening News. He's the man behind the launch of 24-hour news at CBSN. Uh, before his work at CBS, he worked at Bloomberg TV, where he led on the ground coverage. And during his career, he produced interviews with five American presidents and more than two dozen world leaders. Uh, this will be a great dis discussion for those of you that are looking for insight in broadcast news, but from the perspective of the executive producer. On the 11th, we're excited that we got to reschedule uh, Sanford J. Unger. He is um, the current the director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. 
He served as the 24th Voice of America director, having served from 1999 to 2001. Um, with everything happening at Voice of America in just a, in the past few weeks, we look forward to having him and getting his insight. Again, that's on the 11th. On the 18th, we're going to have Ghada Weiss. She is the principal anchor and presenter for Al Jazeera Arabic. She previously worked for a number of Lebanese newspapers, uh, television channels, and radio stations, and has spent more than two decades in broadcast journalism. In a recent Washington Post op-ed back in just a few weeks ago, she discussed the online social media attacks against her, and we look forward to digging deep, deeper with her about the state of journalism for women during the age of cyber attacks. On the 25th, we have a special event that we're gonna be putting together with the freelance community of SPJ, where we're gonna have Rafael Espinal. He is the new president and executive director of the Freelancers Union. Um, we're gonna be presenting a conversation with him and the landscape of the gig economy in America and how it's evolving. We wanna discuss the challenges and the changes that are taking place in the industry, not just in the US, but around the world. And we're really looking forward to having you all join us. Um, we will have all registration information sent to you all in the email coming out later this week. Again, thank you, Bill and Chris, for joining us. It was wonderful to have you both, and I hope we can have you back soon. Thank you, Elle. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Same here. It's